So I believe we can start now, right, Jess? So, uh, or we have to wait for more participants to show up. I think there are a few in the waiting room. So, so shall we heard that there are some Zoom link issues. We are issuing out new ones. So we have a permanent pool of uh, uh, registered participants who get the link and then we have new people registering and somehow there's some some things going on, but hopefully that is fixed and hopefully this number will increase. We usually have around 50 people <laughs> at minimum. So, so let's hope, but anyways, uh, your talk will be online on YouTube and you will give. So yeah. welcome everyone to this Imaging One World Talk. I will keep the intro short. So, so uh, Shalin is Chan Zuckerberg initial at group, sorry, platform leader at Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. He has done a lot of uh, awesome work, both on microscopy image analysis. Uh, he was with Colin Shepard before and, that, and then marine biology labs. Uh, and now he has his own lab. So I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for the opportunity uh, to, to speak with all of you and share some of the really uh, exciting work that's um, have come out of uh, our efforts at the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. Um, and I would like this session to be very interactive. So if you have any questions, uh, please do interrupt. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, quantitative label free imaging of spatio angular architecture of biological systems today. So let me just um, start right in. Uh, uh, what we work on as a, as a platform, as a technology platform, is to develop new technologies. Um, and our work focuses on two, two areas, two types of technology development. One is to make invisible biological uh, properties visible. Um, and, and we do that by integrating optics and computation. Um, so as the field of imaging is advancing, a lot of new uh, advances are, are really coming from a very careful application of computational models and inverse algorithms. Uh, 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 and uh, their joint optimization with optical systems uh, that lets us access the, the information that's previously inaccessible. And we'll see a few examples of that um, uh, today. Uh, now, once the biological system is visualized, it typically is visualized uh, in a Cartesian coordinate system of X, Y, Z, channel, time, um, um, all of those coordinates, acquisition coordinates. But what is really important and exciting is to transform um, that data into coordinates that make sense for the specific biological questions. And uh, we think a lot about how do we identify different cell types from images, uh, multidimensional images, and how do we identify different cell states? We do this work with machine learning, um, uh, including deep learning. Today, I'm just going to focus on this part of our work, uh, making the architecture and activity of uh, biological systems uh, more visible and, and not just developing these tools, but also uh, deploying these tools. Uh, there are a few biological questions uh, or topics that guide a uh, lot of the development we do. And uh, as I was telling Kitty, we are, we, are, uh, uh, we are situated in a very collaborative environment. So the technology development happens in a tight feedback uh, with some of these questions. So our current focus is on uh, image-based screening for infectious diseases. Uh, we have a very strong uh, 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 research program um, in the infectious diseases. Uh, uh, another area where we see a lot of synergy and, uh, uh, and, and, and excitement for the types of measurements I'm going to talk about is mechanobiology. And lastly, also pathology. Uh, so uh, so these, these tools I'm going to talk about, they have really broad uh, application. And uh, before I start, I want to thank my team. Uh, I have an amazing team here uh, and we are growing. Uh, I'll make an announcement towards the end, we are hiring. Uh, and they've done uh, really 
great work. They're very multi multidisciplinary. Um, and I'm going to talk about work from Talon, Xuanming, Ivan, and Li Hao today, as well as Cam, who, who has just moved on to a quantum optics um, uh, company after, after working with us. So um, the, the work we do involves visualizing uh, invisible uh, structures and, and, uh, and their properties. And we do that by, by first thinking about what is it that one wants to measure. Uh, biological imaging is really an inverse problem. We are quite interested in uh, some property of the sample. It may be distribution of fluorophores, it may be diffusion of molecules, uh, maybe some other property, but that's typically the unknown that we are after. So let's say we have an unknown X, uh, and since it is invisible, we need to make it visible, which we do through an optical system. We build a microscope um, to transform that unknown into a measurable and uh, that we can model by some, some operators. Uh, in this case, we, were going, we are going to talk about label free imaging. So uh, we work with illumination of light and, and, the, and the wavefront modulation in the detection path. Invariably, there is some noise. So we end up with some measure, measurement of, uh, of the unknown that's been transformed by the optical system and, and that measurement is corrupted by noise. And we would call this a forward problem. Uh, and the, the forward problem is to generate an informative vibe. Uh, the, inform, the measurement that carries uh, uh, information about the uh, quantity of interest with high fidelity. And the inverse problem is really to estimate uh, the, the unknown uh, from the measurements. And this whole loop of designing uh, a measurement system um, can be called computational imaging. And this is really a growing field. Uh, when we frame the optical systems in terms of the mathematical operators, like any other operator that we might have uh, during analysis of the data, it allows us to exert computational control uh, on its design and uh, on its calibration uh, and allows us to simplify um, often the hardware and uh, delegate some of the complexity in computation, which of course it scales much better than the hardware does. Uh, so this has been uh, our strategy as we have been thinking about how to, how to make new measurements. We have been, uh, uh, we have been designing simpler and simpler hardware and delegating the complexity uh, to, the, to, the, to the algorithms. Uh, I'm going to focus today specifically on uh, label free imaging. Uh, although we have become known over the last four years for label free imaging, we are truly label ag agnostic, but uh, we have made some uh, very exciting developments uh, uh, in, in this domain. So I'll, I'll go into uh, detail of these developments. Uh, now, label free imaging has been around for a long time and it's seeing a, a resurgence, uh, again, thanks to the advancements in computation, uh, both in modeling of the imaging systems as well as just the raw compute power so that you can deal with large amount of data. Um, and examples of uh, label free imaging at different scales are at the molecular scale, we have cryo-electron micrography uh, electron microscopy, sorry. Um, and we have seen, we have all seen these uh, structures of uh, SARS-CoV-2 virions uh, that have been, that have become accessible uh, because of this, this technology. At the other extreme, at the scale of organ, uh, 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 MRI has been around for a long time. And, um, and in particular, uh, it has been used for clinical imaging. Uh, it has also, its variants such as diffusion tensor imaging uh, have also allowed measurement of the diffusion in organs and, and thereby enabled the, the whole field of brain connectomics. And both of these measurements really report, report both of these methods really report uh, electron density or proton density uh, in, the, in, in the specimen and that's being measured. Uh, in, to, in between, uh, there is uh, th there is a very large variety of uh, label-free microscopy methods that are uh, available and that are evolving. 
um, and they they allow you to to see the architecture and and understand the the functions uh, of cells and tissues. As we pursue new methods uh, in in uh, uh, label free, uh, as we pursue new label free methods, our design goal has been to uh, to make correlative measurements of both structure and function. Uh, we we want to design multimodal systems. Um, label free methods report on structures and and if you want to see uh, molecules and and how they govern the function of cells, you do need to use fluorescence. Um, the both of these approaches, uh, those that use label and those uh, that don't use label, they they are quite complementary to each other. And integrating them has uh, has led to some really exciting developments and um, in in many different areas. Uh, we we also want to have uh, robust calibration and reconstruction. The uh, computational imaging methods are uh, are as good as the assumptions that go into the models and and to validate those assumptions, do, uh, it's important to do the calibration well. Uh, we designed the systems to be modular so that they can be integrated with other other types of imaging modalities, um, and also um, uh, pursue higher spatial resolution, temporal resolution, and throughput um, as it makes sense for specific questions. So now uh, a few words about uh, what I mean by spatial angular architecture. When we look at uh, cell, for example, this is a very simple schematic. Um, biomolecules can be organized in a spatial manner, as we all appreciate, but uh, they can also, uh, they also organize in an angular fashion, uh, where uh, they either polymerize or they make uh, sheets, uh, uh, says, and uh, this anisotropic structures, the structures that have angular distribution, uh, really give uh, give rise to to the anisotropic and give shape to the building. Uh, um, and a, an interesting probe, a useful probe of the spatial angular architecture is the permittivity of the biomolecules. Uh, now, if you think about all the biomolecules, uh, lipids, nucleic acid, amino acids, um, sugar molecules, they all are dielectric. And uh, by dielectric, I mean that they, they do not conduct electricity if you, you, you get uh, dipoles in them, you use um, the placement uh, uh, field that, and, and that field radiation modifies the incoming field, uh, which is what we call scattering. So, idea. Um, and this bilayer is illuminated with uh, an electric field. Uh, we are of these um, uh, um, and the dipode is, but also uh, organized in the angular dimensions um, and what you and what you get because of the light matter interaction is a uh, is an ellipsoid 
of the uh, dipole distributions, which gives rise to, which is the source of the refractive index and uh, angle dependent refractive index. Um, and permittivity is simply the square of the refractive index. Uh, so we have the this permittivity tensor, and now you can uh, decompose. We decompose this permittivity tensor in, into an isotropic component, the magnitude of an isotropy, and its 3D orientation. Um, so if we measure the permittivity tensor or its uh, components, we can read out the the properties of the structure, we can get and the angular architecture of the biomolecules. And that's really the, the core optical principle behind, um, behind the measurements we make. Uh, we have a few different uh, designs of, uh, uh, of uh, computational imaging methods for doing so. Uh, and in balancing the trade-offs in different ways, uh, each of the method encodes uh, the invisible uh, through diversity in either illumination uh, and uh, they have slightly different forward models and therefore slightly different uh, reconstruction. I spoke today on work that we published um, in 2020. Uh, uh, we, we developed this method called polarization and uses um, uniform illumination aperture uh, and um, sequentially illuminates the sample with different polarization states and acquires the data, acquires C stacks. Um, and this happens to be more sensitive. Another method, which we'll touch on uh, very briefly towards the end, uh, uses um, uniform circular aperture illumination uh, simultaneously uh, acquires data across four polarization ch channels and also uses C diversity. Uh, and the third method that provides the most complete information, it's just got accepted in, in uh, Nature Methods. Um, it, it should be coming online in a month or so. Um, it's called permittivity tensor imaging. And this method uh, measures um, uh, 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 the, the uniaxial permittivity permittivity tensor that you just saw in the animation uh, before. All right. So what does the data look like? Um, the, this is a movie of a dividing cell. And on the left, we are looking at uh, the phase uh, measurement or the isotropic component of the, uh, of the permittivity tensor. And on the left, we are looking at the um, uh, some, something that may be less familiar, which is the anisotropic component of the permittivity tensor. And the brightness in the background uh, reports the, the magnitude of anisotropy, uh, which is retardance. Uh, and the, the colored lines represent the orientation of the anisotropy. So as you can see from this movie, the, these properties of, of uh, phase and retardance and orientation really um, that you visualize multiple organelles from their physical properties. For example, the nucleolus is the densest in the nucleoplasm. And if you pay close attention, you will notice that nucleoplasm is slightly less than cytoplasm. Um, you can see condensed chromosomes. Uh, you can see lipid droplets. They are uh, quite dense. Um, and if you look at now the, the anisotropy channel, uh, one can see the boundaries of the cells uh, because uh, they're made up of lipid bilayer, which is an anisotropic structure. Uh, one can also see the lipid droplets because they are, uh, because they're, and, and their edges are, are, uh, are anisotropic and, and um, their lumen is isotropic. Uh, we can also see the, the spindle as well as the, the structure of the microtubules within the spindle. Uh, so these measurements um, uh, really provide physical specificity. Uh, it, it's often said that label free imaging is not specific, but it's a different kind of specificity. It, you get physical specificity. We don't know, for example, how what molecules make up the, the spindle, but we know 
that this structure is polymeric and and that it's dynamic and in fact the discovery of spindle happened uh, with polarization microscope and if we trace back the roots of discovery of many biological structures they had to happen uh, and uh, and and with uh, with high quality label free imaging methods so they truly complement uh, fluorescence methods how does this uh, light path work? I'm uh, just going to describe what the raw images look like and how the reconstruction works. Um, the light path is very simple. It's a standard wide field microscope. We start with a LED source um, and that, that um, light is um, um, controlled. Its polarization is controlled through a device uh, uh, that's called universal polarizer. It was developed about 25 years ago uh, uh, by my postdoc mentor, Rudolf Oldenburg. And, um, and it, it's, a, it's a device that's made up of one linear polarizer and two liquid crystal modulators uh, that generates different polarization states. You can generate all the possible polarization states, circular, linear, elliptical. Um, we illuminate the sample with light that's polarized, uh, with dif polarized differently. Uh, collect the uh, image, and, and this is what the raw data looks like. Uh, now, as the light passes through the sample, the polarization is modulated, uh, but we cannot see the polarization. Our eyes are not sensitive to phase or polarization, and therefore we must convert that to intensity. And that conversion happens through an analyzer, which projects the polarized light onto um, on to another polarization state and depending on the, the, the polarization state created by the sample, you get different intensities. And we'll notice here that how the intensity changes as a function of the anisotropy of the structure as well as its orientation. The first state we use is an extinction state uh, we use circularly polarized light. Um, and if the analyzer is left circularly polarized, then we illuminate the sample with the right circularly polarized state. Um, and we get, uh, we, we, in, in that image, you see all the structures, uh, anisotropic structures independent of their orientation. Um, now, uh, this is not enough information to measure the, the anisotropic quantitatively. Um, so we use polarization diversity. We use another elliptical state that's just slightly uh, far away from the uh, from the extinction state um, uh, and has a specific orientation. So we use an ellipse at zero degree, uh, then at sixty degree and one. Degree. And as you can see from these images, the the image itself, the raw image itself, depends on the retardance and orientation. Uh, both at, uh, of, the, of, of the structure. Um, uh, in addition, uh, this image is, uh, has information about the density and the absorption. So the raw images that we acquire with in any polarization microscope, it has mix of information. It, it contains the mixture uh, of contrast because of absorption by the sample, phase by the sample, and the, and the anisotropy of the sample. So the, the, the reconstruction algorithm really disentangles this information. It, it takes this diversity of data and processes that uh, to disentangle all of that information. Now, this was established and this method was called uh, lc Pole scope um, and has been around for a long time. Um, and we, once we realized that there is phase information as well that's encoded, we thought about um, uh, retrieving it uh, from this uh, stacks. And uh, the way we encode the phase information uh, is by, um, by simply defocusing the sample. Uh, defocus is one of the, the, the earliest methods for uh, making phase measurements. And if it is done right, uh, one can do quantitative phase imaging with it uh, in a very uh, inexpensive uh, way with a very simple hardware. Uh, this is what the hardware looks like uh, as implemented on a couple of different uh, commercial microscopes. Uh, the polarization illuminator goes uh, in the 
uh, polarization modulator goes in the illumination path um, and one needs a, a interference filter, uh, a linear polarizer, and then the universal uh, compensator. Uh, so it's a very simple addition to the microscope. And then you add a analyzer in the filter turret. Um, and if you have a, a motorized Z stage, then, then you're really set up to, to do these types of measurements. Um, as we, uh, the next step is to, to reconstruct the sample properties. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we reconstruct the anisotropy. Um, the raw data, uh, captures information about both the sample properties and the, and the parameters of instrumentation. So the first, the parameters of the light one. So the first step is to, to get into the space, uh, uh, to represent the data in the space where the instrument properties are, uh, are removed. We go from the raw intensities to a Stokes representation of light, uh, and, uh, and, and these images show properties of light in the image plane. Um, uh, polarized light can be represented, uh, it, since it's a vector quantity, uh, can be represented by uh, a few different types of calculus, uh, Jones calculus uh, and Stokes calculus. Uh, Stokes calculus is, uh, if you're working with polarized light, um, Stokes calculus is really uh, beneficial, it's advantageous, um, uh, because it lets you uh, do very accurate modeling um, of the microscope and uh, also accurate calibration. Another advantage is that the Stokes calculus can be used to model both label-free and fluorescence uh, polarization microscopes. And I'll have an, an, a very sh small example of uh, fluorescence polarization towards the end. Uh, so we have settled on using Stokes calculus as a frame, as a, as a formalism to model, to create, to write the forward models and, and uh, inverse algorithms for, uh, for our methods. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, formalism um, and, uh, it, and uh, the light is represented by, uh, by, by a vector that with four components. Um, and uh, if you take these three components, the first, second and third Stokes vectors, they they really uh, describe a sphere uh, in a uh, in a in the space of uh, these three Stokes components. The sphere uh, is called Poincaré sphere, and and uh, it it describes how the polarized light um, changes uh, when it interacts with uh, with uh, the, some anisotropic material. Once we have once we transform the raw data into the Stokes space, uh, then after that, the reconstruction of anisotropy can be done uh, either with simple uh, geometric pixel-wise reconstruction or uh, by modeling the diffraction effects of the optics and, uh, and deconvolving the data. Uh, so I'm showing here the results of a pixel-wise reconstruction. Um, and now we can see that we have, uh, from the raw data, we have we have now recovered the retardance, which is the polarization dependent phase delay, independent of the structure orientation of the structure, as well as the principal orientation of the structure. And we represent this data through a few different um, uh, types of maps uh, or plots. Here I'm showing the orientation by line, and you can see that the orientation along which the material is dense, it's perpendicular to the to these to these fibers, um, and the reason is that um, that in rain the the primary source of anisotropy is myelin sheath. Um, so if you imagine that exon is a is a um, uh, is a cable that conducts the action potential, myelin sheath is the insulation around it. Uh, so many layers of lipid bilayer uh, make this sheath. Uh, which make the material dense perpendicular to the long axis of the axons. Um, and this is another type of plot that you will see uh, during the talk. Um, and this is a color map where we encode the, the anisotropy uh, in the brightness and the orientation in this, in this color wheel, in the, in the periodic color wheel. 
uh, another view of the same data. Uh, now I'm showing the slow axis uh, uh, as measured by the microscope. And you can see that at most places, the slow axis is perpendicular to the, to the axon orientation. Um, uh, since the primary source of anisotropy is, is myelination, uh, measurement of the retardance and orientation can be, a, it's, a, it's a good readout of, uh, of myelination itself. And uh, we have found that it can be more reproducible and robust readout uh, than myelin basic protein. Because when you, do, when you do staining for myelin basic protein, you have to extract lipids, which, which, uh, which modifies the sample itself. Um, this data can also be utilized to do analysis of connectivity and changes in the connectivity. You simply have to look 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 at the orientation of axons, which is orthogonal to the uh, the the orientation that we measure with the microscope. Um, when we want to recover the density uh, to the phase, we uh, as I mentioned briefly before, uh, we we encode that information, the density information in a through focus series. If you look at this uh, through focus stack very closely, you would notice some contrast reversal in the background. You see there is a, there is a bright, there's a dark structure here. As we go through the focus, it becomes uh, transparent and very, and very quickly it becomes, uh, becomes bright. So these contrast reversals report on the uh, curvature, uh, local curvature of the sample. Um, and the, the transverse curvature of the, the phase of the sample uh, affects the, the actual derivative of intensity. And this relationship is called transport of intensity. And, and if we model that right, uh, we can write an optimization problem to deconvolve the phase from this data. And the advantages are that you have uh, much better denoising of the morphology information. And at, at the same time, the measurements are now quantitative. You can uh, say that this region of the, the tissue is less dense than this region, or these uh, small dots, which are nuclei, are less dense than the, than the surrounding tissue. And that becomes even, one can extend this to 3D, uh, and these uh, comparison of density of the nucleoplasm and, and the surrounding uh, cytoplasm become much more clear when you have uh, quantitative data. In this movie, uh, I'm showing a bright field stack, uh, and next to it is a, is a phase stack that's deconvolved from this bright field stack. And let's pause here. You can see this is a kidney tissue section. Uh, you can see that the nuclei are in fact less dense than the uh, than the surrounding um, cytoplasm and the tissue. And um, it was initially a surprise to us when we saw that, but that's been confirmed by several other methods as well. Um, but if you look at a, a phase, a, a right field image at, at any position, you cannot make that quantitative uh, determination of the of the properties. Uh, as I mentioned, we wanted this method is, is quite modular, so it's very easy to multiplex uh, the label free imaging, uh, the, the modes of label free imaging that we can acquire with fluorescence imaging on um, almost any fluorescence microscope. We have integrated QLIP with uh, confocal, with wide field. This data is from a confocal, um, as well as now we are working on a combined label free and light sheet microscope. Um, now, with multimodal data uh, come few opportunities, and one of them is to, to, to see many landmarks of tissues and cells and, and uh, with label-free imaging and, and demultiplex them uh, with deep learning. Um, so I'm just going to briefly uh, put a plug for our work on virtual staining, uh, which was also reported in that uh, 2020 paper. And, and we're continuing to work on this um, to make this uh, more robust and, and uh, broadly useful. Uh, now, this uh, method really relies, the, 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 uh, the ability to acquire good data with this method really requires uh, very good calibration. Uh, calibration is really the black magic of computational imaging. Uh, methods uh, succeed or fail 
based on how well uh, the calibration protocols are designed and implemented. And um, to make this tool accessible, to make the calibration and the acquisition accessible, uh, we have been working on an acquisition pipeline, uh, which can be uh, easily adopted. Uh, we are we are uh, we call this tool recorder. We call this pipeline recorder, short for record order, um, and uh, it controls the hardware uh, as well as uh, controls the rest of the controls the polarization. Um, modulation hardware and controls the rest of the microscope via, via micromanager. So the structure of the software is that we, we use micromanager, uh, which is a great software if you are uh, uh, developing your own microscopes. Uh, and uh, we interact uh, with it. We control the, the, the devices from Python by using a bridge called micromanager. Um, and the record recorder plugin um, has has calibration algorithms that will figure out the right polarization states for a given light path uh, and has background correction algorithms has reconstruction algorithms as well as visualization tools um, to make it to 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 enable acquisition of high quality data while you are on the microscope so we have just released the beta it's now available on napari hub um, if um, any of you are interested in intrigued by these ideas and interested in in um, in having this method in in your work, um, uh, please please reach out to us. Uh, our goal this year is to closely collaborate with uh, with about ten labs. Uh, we are a very small team, as you saw at the start, um, and we want the tool to to scale um, to many problems. Um, and and the 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 project is still in beta, so there are a lot of bugs, and we'll really appreciate um, working with 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 the community and figuring out those bugs and and making this tool robust. So that's really uh, the summary of uh, Qlip, and I'm now about two new methods that. Uh, that we have been working on that have just, and that will be appearing soon uh, in, in the journals. So the second method that can go really fast is the multimodal instant pole scope, um, there we utilize a instant polarized uh, polarization detector instead of, uh, instead of doing the polarization modulation in sequence. Um, uh, we have built a custom detector with four cameras. Uh, one can also buy a camera from from um, uh, from FLIR, uh, which uh, which now sells a polarization sensor. Uh, and with this method, we can go really fast because we don't incur the penalty of sequentially switching polarization channels, and that lets us um, uh, acquire spatial angular dynamics. Uh, of cells and molecular assemblies. So this movie walks you through measure, uh, measurements of, uh, of density and anisotropy in uh, both label-free and fluorescence channels. So we are going to start with um, this, this image is, that shows the density uh, and uh, uh, without label, uh, density of the uh, F-actin uh, uh, with a label, uh, an isotropy in a label free mode and an isotropy uh, of the uh, aligned actin fibers. Uh, they are all measured on the same system. And we can do that over, over time. We can do this in a time resolved fashion. Um, so by combining the parallel detection with, uh, with, with four cameras, and uh, and and really driving the the uh, the, the microscope really uh, fast, um, uh, we are able to to make these measurements. Um, and these open up some really exciting possibilities of uh, for the field of mechanobiology. Um, in many cases, uh, when you are uh, trying to measure the mechanical properties of biological systems. You want time-resolved measurements of the um, of the density and the anisotropy of the structures. Um, so, in this this really uh, uh, colorful, beautiful movie, you can see how uh, how we are able to resolve 
the, the structure of sarcomere, uh, sarcomeres within the myofibrils in beating cardiomyocytes. These are iPSC-derived uh, cardiomyocytes. And, and you can also follow their contractile activity. Um, and this is a zoom into a small region. And if, uh, if you, uh, you can see that uh, in the uh, density image, one can visualize the Z disk uh, of the sarcomere. And in the anisotropy image, you can visualize the A band uh, of the sarcomere. And we have found that these readouts of the density and uh, of the Z disk and, and, uh, and A band can be more consistent, can be more reproducible. Because if you try to do antibody labeling, you are going to incur some uh, stochasticity uh, due to labeling. Um, so in cases where these measurements uh, work, uh, where the questions are really about visualizing architecture and activity and, this, and, that, and the structure of interest, has uh, uh, is is visible uh, beyond background. Uh, this this these readouts can be quite valuable, and one can do optical flow analysis and and uh, and understand really the contractile activity of cells from this data. Um, so finally, uh, touching on the design that gives us the most information, uh, both the designs that I've talked about. Uh, they have uh, they, they are not able to measure the true 3D orientation. I, I used the word projected anisotropy uh, earlier uh, because what happens is that just like a spatial imaging system where you have uh, an isotropic resolution in X, Y, and Z, uh, you have an isotropic resolution in orientation um, in an, in, okay, let me choose the words right here. Um, uh, we know that when we have a standard microscope, we, we have poorer resolution in, in depth uh, than in X5 because we're imaging with one lens and that lens looks at the sample from uh, in X5 from, uh, from larger cone than a design and we the polar analogous issue where we control the polarization states or analyze the polarization states in the XY plane, but not out of the plane. And as a result, the measurements are, uh, the, the anisotropy is projected into the focal plane. Um, and we know that biology doesn't follow Cartesian coordinates. It's, it has its own internal coordinate system. So it's really valuable to be able to measure the 3D anisotropy, the out of plane component of the anisotropy. And this new design, uh, 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 allows us to do that. Uh, we, um, we combine the polarization resolved imaging with uh, illumination from many different directions. So you can think of this as a, a tomographic measurement. So I'll just show some data. Um, we are uh, going to zoom into this small part uh, of the mouse brain section, corpus callosum. And, um, and as, I, as this movie plays, you will be able to see um, the structure of the tissue at multiple scales. Uh, first, at the scale of the exon bundles. Um, uh, on, the, on the left side, we are looking at the, the components of an isotropy. Uh, it's a uh, vector quantity with 3D orientation. So we parameterize it in terms of the out of, out of plane tilt, in plane orientation, as well as the magnitude of an isotropy. And uh, on the right, we are looking at the density. And as the movie plays, one can see um, different parts of the tissue. You can see nuclei again, darker than the surrounding. And now we begin to, as we zoom in, we begin to resolve specific um, uh, bundles uh, and, and the boundaries of the exons. Some of the exons are, are optically sectioned in uh, a transverse direction and some are uh, optically sectioned in the longitudinal direction. And you can appreciate from this, this data, the spatial resolution that we have, uh, not just in XY, but also in, in depth. Um, so it is possible with label-free imaging to get confocal-like sectioning um, and, um, and, and get 3D data, 3D measurements. Uh, this concludes uh, what I wanted to share today. Uh, in conclusion, I would say that biological architecture is truly spatioangular. 
um, if um, uh, if we uh, use polarization of light, then it's possible to access the angular component of the architecture. Um, uh, the method we have developed, uh, uh, quantitative label free imaging with phase and polarization, it's a good tool for sensitive analysis of spatio angular architecture. Um, and lastly, I would say, as label free imaging is becoming more and more quantitative, it's also possible to do uh, specific analysis uh, with it. And in the end, uh, I would just want to point out that we are hiring uh, a software engineer who will be extending these tools uh, in 4D. We have the optical designs, we have the algorithms. What we need to do next is to, to control the microscope, drive it hard, uh, and integrate all of these algorithms in a pipeline that can be, that can be used efficiently, for, both for acquisition and, and reconstruction. So if you or your, your colleagues are, are excited about this, please, please do reach out. And thank you so much. Thanks, Alan. Thank you very much indeed. Um, <clears throat> shall we go into the quiz now? So, uh, Shalin, if you could uh, unshare, I'll, I'll get the quiz up. Yes. All right, thank you very much. Should be able to see the quiz there now. Um, See if anyone's going to join us. So the link was in the uh, chat on the side of the talk. Uh, you can still see that. Everyone got that? Right. <laughs> don't have any participants yet? Well, why don't we um, kick off with the questions and while we're waiting for people to join in? They all want to come and join in the quiz. Oh yeah, we got amazing. We got someone here. Great. That's what I'd put in there if I was able to, <laughs> if I was allowed to. Um, I think we have a question now. Oh, here we go. People are coming in. All right. Oh, we now five participants. We just give it a moment. See if anyone else wants to join in. Uh, while we're waiting, I'll answer one question. Uh, what is the tissue slice thickness? Um, and the thickness up to which these methods can image, they are, they are the same as confocal. Uh, all of these methods are limited by the scattering. Uh, and so about really depends on the sample. In the brain tissue, that's about 50 micron. In zebra fish, we can image up to the depth of 200 to 300 micron. Right. Okay, I think we should start the quiz. So what I'm gonna do is take us through to the first question. Here we go. Question number one, here are all our uh, participants. And let's see, fingers on the buzzers, everybody. Most biomolecules are, question coming up, ferroelectric, dielectric or fluorescence. Answers as quick as you can. Right, time's up. Let's see what we've got. Everyone's gone for dielectric. Everyone got it right. Hooray. Let's see who's on the leaderboard. Bill is up in the lead. St. Elmo and Kathy and Lola and Y are all on your tail. So, um, Watch out, Bill, someone's coming after you. Right, next question. And that's coming up now. There we go. I've got a very slow Mentimeter link today. Well, which properties of biomolecules contribute to the images acquired with polarization microscopy method? Is it absorption, phase, retardance, and orientation? Phase retardance and orientation or retardance alone. What do you think? Got four seconds left. Let's see you as quickest on the draw. Oh, split between the two and three got that one. So let's see who's now in the lead. And racing ahead on the question. See that.
question. And uh, question number three is, I think, uh, how does quantitative label-free imaging with phase and polarization as QLIP encode refractive index variations? Is it by interference between unscattered and scattered light, diverse angles of illumination, or interference between a plane wave and scattered light? Now, I've definitely heard the answer to that question during the talk. Yeah, it is interference between unscattered and scattered. Let's see. We've got that. Right. Why? Oh, Emery. And is a, let's see if that's enough to read. Right. Why is now slipped into the lead? Okay, I think this is, <laughs> this is an interesting competition because everyone thinks that the leaderboard is changing constantly. Let's see what happens with this question, question number four. How do density and anisotropy of nucleoplasm, lipid droplets and cytoplasm compare? Density of nucleoplasm and lipid droplets are greater than cytoplasm, both are isotropic. Density of lipid droplets is greater than cytoplasm, greater than nuclei. Edges are isotropic or density of lipid droplets. I can't read them. That's, oh yeah. People are faster than I can even read them out. That's great. And uh, he said he did pick up on the important thing about the anisotropy there as well. So that's good. Let's see what the leaderboard's doing now. Maybe we have another winner. Kathy has won this round. But why? And Emery left an unassailable lead, maybe. Let's see what happens. Last question. Question number five. All right. The Jones calculus to represent image formation with polarized light because it models and calibrates both fluorescence and label free polarization. Stokes enables cleaner factorization of absorption, or Stokes calculation of them enables faster reconstruction, which is it? It models and calibrates both fluorescence and label free polarization. So I did have to shorten the answers on that one because of uh, the limitations of the Mentimeter. So here we have Let's see who's, who's the winner. Ah, oh, Kathy's enough. Let's see. Ah, oh, no. why you are the winner? If you would find them. Um... Big <laughs> Okay, just uh, there you go. Stick your uh, answer in there. Your contact details in the chat. Oh, and, uh, you did very well guessing. Okay, Curtis, do you want to run the questions or shall I? Uh, I can do that. So, Shalin, you already answered the first one. The second one, actually, we also invite. So, well, in team, if you want to ask the question yourself. Please uh, unmute and and yeah. Also, if you want to unmute your video, please go on. Else, I will just do it for you. Okay, maybe they are not there. So, have you tried this on clear tissue? While most uh, RI variations are eliminated, residual tiny variations may have valuable information while allowing to image very thick samples. We have. So uh, we, the clearing does help. We have tried it with uh, in collaboration with our colleagues who work with zebrafish. Um, you can clear an adult zebrafish and you can you can you can see the structure, uh, the exon structure uh, in the brain with that. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the parameter to fine tune is how much lipid you extract because most clearing methods do extract mm -hmm. lipids. And that can lead to loss of uh, loss of contrast. Uh, there are a few methods that are designed to do index matching, uh, uh, and some of them are very simple. Uh, just uh, embedding the sample in a in a crowding molecule, um, they really work well. Uh, so with that, you can reduce the scattering, uh, image deeper, but not lose the structure that gives rise to to the contrast. I think the last question, Nick, is from you. Yeah, what? so I, I just wondered if um, this on microscope, you've got an objective and a condenser. And usually, yes, the, the lower one is what's limiting the. Yeah. 
Is that the case? Yeah, that's a, that's a great observation. So uh, the resolution in a transmission microscope is governed by both the NAs, uh, the imaging NA as well as the illumination NA. Um, and the, uh, the effective NA of, that governs the resolution is the sum of both of these NAs. So one can, one can utilize this fact for a few different, uh, for, for, for some different uh, designs. Uh, one can um, increase the illumination NA beyond the imaging NA and mm -hmm. push the resolution while maintaining the field of view. So you can work with a low NA objective and uh, and illuminate with a uh, with a large uh, condenser NA, and and if you do computational optics with that type of design, you can push the resolution, and that's the field of dichrography. Mm -hmm. um, as we increase the condenser NA, we also uh, have uh, uh, we also increase the depth sectioning. Um, the sectioning in the transmission comes from the interference of light, and as we increase the NA of condenser we constrain the interference of light to the smaller and smaller slices. Right. Uh, and the, the, reason, the reason we have really good sectioning in the data that you saw uh, in the brain tissue is because we were illuminating with, a, uh, with an annual of 1.4. We were imaging with the annual of 1.47 and illuminating with the annual of 1.4. Wow, okay. Can I just ask a supplementary question actually? How many Z slices are you typically taking in to get? get How Sorry, I didn't catch. How easy uh, did you? How many Z slices? How many Z slices? Yeah. Um, in that stack, um, we took. Uh, I'll have to look into the data, but on the order of hundred. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Alan, we have one more question from Alexandro. So, Alexandro, are you still there? You want to ask? Uh, yeah. No, it's just a very small technical question. So yeah. I. I I was checking now which camera uh, you have been uh, using. And so I was wondering, because in the past, I kind of got interested with this polar, um, the polarizing, polarized camera, mm -hmm. um, but I never came to, you know, to test it and so on. Do you have any suggestion about how does it compare compared to cameras that you used or, you know, do you have any? Mm -hmm. uh, so the FLIR cameras, they have a polarization grid on top. Yeah, uh, that's that's uh, manufactured. Uh, it is somewhat. It is quite a bit lossy. Um, mm -hmm. So the effective uh, QE of the sensor after the polarization filtering is twenty three percent. So it's really not great if you want to do fluorescence polarization measurements. But if you're doing label free measurements, you are not photon limited. You have a lot of photons, um, and and it's it's you can you can use it especially for tissues. So empirically speaking. We have found that uh, we can get really high quality data if you're doing tissue imaging. If you're doing pathology, you can put a simple circular polarizer in your illumination path on the condenser and put in an image with this polarization camera. Um, and, and that will give you really interesting data. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, and also, I guess because is, uh, you have four images, each of them uh, is like the RG, RG, RGB camera. So the, each of them okay. is losing light uh, on top of the quantum efficiency. I guess this is the problem. That's, yeah. that, that's an issue, yeah. So when we work with cells, we, we always work with, uh, um, uh, with, uh, S, with CMOS, S CMOS cameras. In fact, yeah. we do use some of the FLIR cameras, the, the IMX uh, 250 chip uh, that is used by many of the FLIR cameras. It's almost as good as scientific CMOS. These cameras don't have cooling. So the noise is slightly higher, but again, with, when we work with, with transmitted light, there's a lot of light. So it's very easy to get into the short noise limited regime. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe Sharon, I will ask one last quick question. Since you have a background in super resolution imaging also, I yep. was wondering if you, if you are trying to combine all these, uh, integrate these methods. And one slightly uh, related question, uh, I know this company Nanolight, which produces a lot of fantastic yeah. label images, but they are slightly different in concept. So I was wondering, how do you see integrating that also? Yeah. Yeah. So both very good questions. So first, um, we we are very actively integrating fluorescence in our uh, measurements. Um, lately, the questions we have been engaged with uh, 
making mechanobiological measurements at the scale of whole cells and, and tissues, um, imaging screens for studying infectious diseases or tissue pathology, they haven't required that we push down on the diffraction limit of fluorescence. Um, so we do combine uh, our, our current projects, combine a lot of fluorescence measurements and label-free measurements uh, at the diffraction limit. Uh, but we are pushing more on the, the throughput, on the, 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 the 4D imaging, and, and those dimensions um, that's that's aligned more with the questions that we are uh, we are uh, interested in. Um, and Nanolife's system is amazing, and it's it's a really nice design, and they've done really um, good work in deploying the uh, the concept of holo holographic tomography uh, and making it accessible and generating a lot of exciting data. Uh, there are some fundamental optical design trade-offs between any holographic method and the, the types of methods that I just described. Um, so we have been using propagation-based uh, methods to, to encode the phase and the anisotropy. Uh, first of all, NanoLive reports only the phase um, and, and uh, these, uh, the method that I described reports both. Um, but we have been using propagation-based methods. Um, and these methods uh, don't use coherent light um, and holographic imaging systems where you interfere a, uh, an a reference beam with the sample beam, they have to use, they have to use coherent light. Um, so when you have long longitudinal coherence in the beam, and if you work with lasers, you know that it can be scattered and you get all the interference patterns because of uh, scattering that happens in multiple planes. So um, with uh, holographic imaging, uh, uh, one has to have a very clean light path. They are not very robust uh, to, to, to dust in the light path, to slice, slight misalignment, uh, whereas the propagation-based methods like ours, they're, they're very forgiving. They're more forgiving. Uh, you do color illumination and you can have, your illuminator can be slightly off axis and that's not a problem. Um, and uh, the, uh, the designs that we have, they're quite modular. Uh, we can easily multiplex these designs with HNE imaging. We can multiplex it with uh, spatial transcriptomics with, uh, and, and those are some of the ideas we're exploring right now, uh, not just fluorescence, uh, because you, are, you have isolated models that go in, in, in the illumination and then you can take one of the ports and put this detector on, the, uh, on that port. So there is advantages of modularity. There is uh, there are advantages of robustness. There are advantages of depth sectioning if you use the high illumination NA. Uh, one key uh, advantage that tomographic holographic methods have is that they give you access to the lowest spatial frequencies. I'm going into the details now. Uh, the lowest spatial frequencies of the structure. Um, so the phase images that you saw uh, that I shared. Uh, you might have noticed that the background looks gray, uh, not black. And the reason is that with propagation-based methods, we don't have access to the lowest spatial frequencies which come from the background. Whereas if you look at NanoLife's movies, you do see that the background is black. Um, and really depending on the question, uh, that may guide the choice of uh, which tools work. Um, we have also, uh, you know, piloted NanoLive here. It will be really fun to add polarization capabilities to that design, but we don't have an active project uh, right now in that direction. Following up on the first question, like I, I see like pathologists and clinicians not getting carried away by the promise of resolution, though one can always argue, you know, more information, more signal to noise, you know, the better data is and the better downstream analysis will be. So why do you think this reluctance in the field of pathology to go for, let's say, let's say if we at some point make, you know, all these super resolution methods faster and large field of views, but I think there's still reluctance there, right? Not to go for these super resolution and still stick with like wide fields, slide scanners kind of things. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, I, I was, uh, and this has nothing to do with science, really. <laughs> I was in an office. I, I visited uh, a, one of our pathology collaborators, and she um, she showed me around. And and at least in the U.S., this has to with has to do with the billing system uh, that every slide that they work with it has in, in a clinical setting it has to be built and there is this complexity bureaucratic complexity uh, that uh, limits the adoption uh, in pathology pathology is really fundamentally a clinical problem and um, and uh, for the tools to be useful they have to be used in clinic uh, which adds of course the whole new layer of complexity um, but i think more fundamentally um, uh, for pathology, for anal, for detecting pathology, for doing for the diagnosis, it is valuable to 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 push on super some of the super resolution methods. I would say uh, because uh, often the diagnosis depends on the detection of specific markers. We have come across some uh, questions where where the path the diagnosis would really benefit from being able to see tight junctions. Um, and the, the, the disease had to do with epithelia. And uh, in the course of the disease, the tight junction distribution changes, and we know that they are sub-resolution. So, so I think there is a value. Uh, I think the adoption uh, is somewhat hampered by, um, uh, by the economics of science let, or economics of medicine, uh, more than the science or medicine itself. I don't want to take more of your time, but there are a couple of uh, few questions coming up. So, uh, are you busy, Shalin? Shall we answer them or you want to <laughs> take them, the questions? Uh, yes, yeah, so there's a, what is the estimated cost uh, for updating a microscope? Uh, FLIR camera costs on the order of 3000 and a circular polarizer would cost maybe 500, $600. Um, the modalities that I described, including the permittivity tensor imaging, uh, they all cost less than twenty thousand uh, US dollars to to add to the the system. And oh yes, links. Uh, Follow Sh Shalin on Twitter and yeah. get all the bio yes. links, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Somebody Thank you. posted. Yeah, so Alexandro posted it. So thanks, Alexandro. So thank you. Fantastic, Bob Shalan. Uh, very cool, impressive images. I was always blown by them. So yeah, I I always love listening to you. So yeah. thanks for thank coming. You. Thanks for having me. Really, really enjoyed. Really enjoyed thank the you. trip.